Good evening, everyone, and come back. Well, welcome back. So I'm Daniela from um, Vets for Ukraine 2022. Um, uh, we have just realized that we have a problem on Facebook, uh, and our link on Facebook is uh, currently not working. Um, and we are writing like a, a message on Facebook uh, pleasing you to go to LinkedIn. So if you want to follow uh, for the moment uh, the webinar uh, and this live, please go and find us on LinkedIn. Uh, for those of you that do not know uh, Vets for Ukraine 2022, uh, we are a group of specialists who decided to join together um, in order to help um, the Ukrainian uh, people in difficulties. And the way we decided to uh, help is offering a CPD uh, for free. So each of us will present or has presented a CPD um, practically every day. And you can see here uh, the provisional schedule. I'm saying provisional because after the, the our CPDs will not end on the 14th of uh, April with Vicky Lipscon, but they we will go ahead even after Easter. And there are new um, um, speakers that will uh, join us. Um, now, because it's important to share. Uh, the link to as many as people as possible. Um, I would like to please Paolo to launch the uh, share countdown for us. So now um, uh, the, the um, countdown share is very important because it's our invitation to you to share and to spread the voice uh, in the world wide and, wide and far to involve as many as people as possible and uh, to us um, whoever is listening to these webinars to donate uh, for the Ukrainian cause. So please uh, share, 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 and if you can, uh, please don't forget to donate. Uh, we have here, uh, here the link where you can donate is www.justgiving.com slash vets for Ukraine. So please click on the link and donate because every little helps. And even if you donate a few pounds, a few euros, these will make a difference for the people in difficulties in Ukraine. Um, now, um, we have received already uh, many additions to the initiative that we have uh, started on Sunday. So I'm talking about the Vets for Ukraine 2022 uh, uh, t-shirt, made the t-shirt. And, and therefore, just for those that has, have not seen the video uh, yet, I would like to uh, share again the video that we have, we have made over the weekend to invite everyone to uh, take part to our initiative and to do their own t-shirt. So, Paolo. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniela Murgia from Vets for Ukraine 2022, and I'm a small animal surgeon. The reason for my message to you today is because I would like to let you know that our Facebook group Vetonea has now reached the thousand adhesions and I would like therefore thank you from the deep of my heart for your support, for your help, for being with us, for helping us, helping the people in Ukraine. Please uh, keep, keep, keep supporting each initiative that you might find online or everywhere to support uh, Ukrainian people and in particular to support our veterinarian colleagues in Ukraine. To, um, to boost uh, a little bit our campaign, we would like again to ask you to spread the word wide and far, everywhere, to your parents, to your family, to your colleagues, to your friends, to your 
into the university uh, in the veterinary clinics where you are working please do that because it's very important that we reach as many people as possible in order also to collect as many donations as possible so now if you want to feel a little bit more part of this great initiative uh, just find like a, an old t-shirt, a t-shirt, simply a t-shirt and a couple of marker pens or simply a, a black marker pen and write our message and post it on your social media, post it on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, wherever, just post it like I will do. So dear friends and colleagues, here I'm back again and in the meantime I made this t-shirt. It took me like 10 minutes to do it and it was super easy. You just need a white t-shirt and a marker pen. Follow me, do your t-shirt, post it on your social media and let's support Vets for Ukraine 2022 all together. Cari amici italiani, uh, questa è uh, la maglietta che ho appena fatto, ci ho messo 10 minuti, è molto semplice, vi serve una maglietta bianca, una marker pen e um, seguitemi. Fate le vostre magliette e postatele sui vostri social media. Così insieme possiamo supportare Vets for Ukraine 2022. So, liebe Freunde, Kolleginnen und Kollegen, das ist das T-Shirt, das Sie gerade gemacht haben. Folgen Sie mir, posten Sie Ihre T-Shirt in Ihren sozialen Medien und gemeinsam unterstützen wir Vets for Ukraine 2022. So, many thanks for your attention and bye bye. Grazie a tutti per la vostra attenzione e ci vediamo presto. Vielen Dank für Ihre Zeit und auf Wiedersehen. So make your own T-shirt and take a picture, a photo and post it on our Vetonia page or post it on your social media. Um, now, um, you, for those of you uh, who, knows, uh, who know us, um, we have our usual message in a bottle. Um, one of our first message in a bottle was uh, talking about a colleague of ours um, who organized um, uh, two vans with veterinary supplies to bring uh, those supplies to Poland uh, and to help uh, uh, the Ukrainian people at the border with Poland and also the animals. Uh, this colleague is a is a vet and he, wo he works in the UK. In particular, he works at Vale Vets in Dursley, and his name is uh, Jakob Trojanowski. Um, I would like to ask Paolo to post the if if Paolo can share the message in a bottle with the story of uh, Jakob. So, um, Jakob uh, Trojanowski um, was concerned how he could have helped um, uh, people in Ukraine and, and pets in Ukraine. And therefore, he just, uh, as I mentioned, he just organized two uh, large bands and he brought uh, supplies uh, to Poland. And here we see um, all. Uh, so some pictures of what he did. Um, he was not alone in, in, in this initiative because he was helped by other vets um, working close to the uh, surgery where he works. Uh, but today uh, we have a surprise for you because we have tried to contact Jacob, Jacob, and Jacob has kindly accepted to be our guest so we can, uh, so that we can ask him directly um, how was his initiative, initiative how, how he managed to do this, uh, I would say, heroic um, uh, thing that he has done. So Jacob is a real hero. He's not a hero of the comics. He's, he's a, a human being and he's a hero. So let's see. Jacob, are you with us? Yes, hello. Hello, hello there you are. Hi, Jacob. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. How are you, Jacob? Yes, thank you for inviting me, uh, Roel. Um, yes, you wanted to ask about how it all started, I guess. Yes, I wanted. We wanted to know how are you, um, how will the idea to do what you have done, how, where it where it originated from, and then how you managed to 
organize everything because it's really actually a big, big, big effort what you have done and and I'm I'm very grateful. So thank you for I think I can speak for everyone. So it's it's simply great what you have done. Thank you, thank you for saying that. Um, well, we've uh, we originally I'm Polish and uh, we tend to go on holidays. Uh, uh, spend holidays in Poland, and so it so happened that um, our holiday uh, finish was finishing uh, around the time where the Ukrainian conflict has started, and we witnessed the um, refugees. And after returning here to UK, it just seemed like you know we needed to do a, a little bit more than just donating uh, money. Um, and we quickly realised, me and my wife, that we knew people there on the ground. You know that actually are uh, helping and, and they just physically uh, need certain items. Um, and that's how it started. And initially just wanted to go in my car and a, with, a, with a little trailer behind. Um, and people have been so kind, donated so much that uh, it ended up being two vans. Fantastic. And how was the journey through Europe? How long did it take? Um, it wasn't that it wasn't that long, really. Um, the the vans had humanitarian aid uh, sign on it, so we had um, quite a lot of um, you know green light and kind of passing the passing the queues on borders, and um, everybody was very kind. Um, it helped a lot. We also did see a lot of convoys um, um, from Switzerland, Germany. Uh, there was one in, from France and there's quite a few vehicles um, going in the direction of Ukraine. So um, the journey took a little bit over 24 hours each way, which uh, wasn't too bad, I guess. And did you do it in one go or did you... Well, we, 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 did, we did have to stop because all this packing and preparing was, uh, you know, was quite exhausting. The, the build up to the journey um, was uh, very intensive. So we, we, had to, we had to take a little bit of rest. Okay, and then when you arrived there, yeah, how how what what did you see? How how was the situation? Yeah, so so we 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 went um, to two places. Uh, one place uh, was uh, purely the um, humanitarian aid, um, and that place was quite busy. Uh, it's uh, in a little place called Cheshanov, which is um, practically walking distance from the border. Um, and it's like a hub where people drop off things uh, and things are being repacked, relabeled, and then taken to uh, to the border or across uh, the border to Ukraine. Um, uh, certainly very busy, uh, very busy place, very busy people, um, but honestly very well organized. Um, the, the other place was just vet veterinarian help. Um, and that there is a um, center in Przemysl, which is also a, a town just 30 kilometers away from border. Um, they have been involved in helping uh, people fleeing the Ukraine, you know, looking at the animals, vaccinating against rabies and things like that, but also helping some of the animal shelters um, <laughs> across the border, um, in Lvov, um, or even further. Um, so yeah, they've obviously happy take, happily taken the donations and, and we stay in touch. Amazing. And Jakob, do you think, was this just a one-off initiative or are you thinking to repeat it in the future or do something different? <clears throat> well, I, I've certainly considered doing a little bit more. Um, however, um, what they need the most now, I think, is actually money and human uh, power um, because there's a lot of donations that have already arrived. Um, I feel like from, from all they're saying to me, um, you know, the, the, the donations are there. It's mainly humans and money for um, for petrol, for example, diesel. That's, that's quite a big expense to, to, you know, to keep things running across the border. Okay, I think, do you want to, would you like to make an appeal? Do you want to say something to our, to the people on the other side of the camera? Well, uh, <coughs> using the opportunity, I, I, I really want to say that it would be worth um, keeping our eye on the situation because when, uh, you know, a few weeks or months down the line, when um, the media will start shifting towards a different 
different uh, political situation somewhere else in the world. I, I, my worry is that Ukraine um, can get a little bit forgotten, maybe. And therefore, I would say, for those who really want to help, let's just sit tight and get ready for further help that will be needed in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Jakob. Sorry, but I had like, <laughs> like a crisis of coughing. I had to drink something. Sorry about that. So I think is uh, what you have done is really amazing. <clears throat> and I wish that there, were, there was someone else that uh, could organize something so spectacular what you have already done. And I would like also to thank in the name of <clears throat> all, our, all the veterinarians, to thank all the people that have helped you. Thank you, your wife, everyone that has helped you. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of people, and I, I, I really appreciate it. I wouldn't be able to do it myself, um, uh, especially my colleagues uh, from work. Uh, they've been absolutely amazing. Thank you very much. So, Jakub, do you think you, you will want to stay with us and follow the webinar uh, of our next Absolutely. So you're very welcome and feel free to contact us and to, I think, I'm pretty sure we will stay in contact in the future because this uh, initiative and this situation, which is horrible, but it's, I'm realizing it's really creating new um, connections and new friendships. So we, we are getting united all together to help people in difficulties. And um, I wish, um, Obviously, the, the war is not the, the best situation to, to, to create new, new friendships, but um, at least there is a little, you know, a little of positive so mm. that we are coming all together uh, to help. And I think this is great. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah. Thank you, Jakob. And I see you. I see you soon. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much. You soon. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye bye bye, Jakob. So I must apologize because it seems that I'm suffocating here. So my voice is going down and down and down. Um, so we still have the problem with Facebook and we are not in the position now to uh, go live on Facebook, but we are going live on, on LinkedIn. So, but uh, no worries because this live as all the others is recorded. So, and once we will be done with the live, we will put a recording on Facebook. So for those that, who, for those who don't have uh, an account on LinkedIn, <coughs> excuse me, they will be able to follow the webinar by Jan Ladlo, Jay Ladlo on uh, recorded. So, and now this is the moment to introduce Jane. Jane Ladlow is um, um, uh, a colleague, a diplomat in surgery, <coughs> excuse me, who has dedicated her uh, activity, her profession to the brachycephalics, the brachycephalics breeds. And today she will talk about what's top tips for diagnosis and management. <coughs> Jane, are you here? Jane, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm, something is happening with my voice. It's horrible. I couldn't do a presentation that, you know, that honors your, your presence here. But I'm very grateful you are here with us. You're and, most welcome. And I'm very looking forward to listen to your uh, webinar on Braxifalic Dogs. Thanks so much, Jane. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, it was very inspiring to hear about Jakob and what he's been doing. Um, full full marks to actually doing some action rather than um, putting on lectures, but I'm, I'm super impressed with that. Um, I I was thinking about that. Jane has devoted her research and her, her career to brachycephalics, not deliberately. I just want to say this, okay? So it just happened that I was working in, in an area of looking at respiratory function and I kind of fell into this. So now when I look at it, I think, really, did I do that? And why did I do that? Um, however, um, I have learned quite a lot about the brachycephalic breeds over the last 20 years. Um, yeah, I wish I'd done something a little bit less, um, maybe, I don't know, controversial. But anyway, I, I have got a bit of an experience about these breeds. And I was going to share some of um, the tips I've learned about the brachycephalic, extreme brachycephalics, actually, um, in the next hour. Okay. Hopefully. 
hopefully I'm going to share. There we go. So I was going to start off with tips on assessment and then a little bit about the preoperative preparation if we're thinking about surgery. Um, a little bit about the surgeries we can do now and how to make the recovery is a little bit smoother. OK, so the surgery isn't so difficult, but getting these guys out of the practice um, in, a, in a nice, calm, healthy condition can be tricky. So I'm going to talk predominantly about the extreme brachycephalic breed. So most of the work I've done has been on the pug, the French bulldog and the bulldog. Um, and the issue they have is obviously conformational. It's related to the base of the skull. So it's, it's an abnormal um, cartilage and, and bone suture malformation at the base of the skull. So around the basisphenoid bones. And it results in not just a short nose, which everyone fixates on, but on a, on a whole flattened skull. So it is the skull itself that is also short, um, and including the calvarium, and it's also increased in width. OK, so it's this people don't like flat face, but I think the flat face is, is kind of about right. OK, so these breeds are flat faced. And the breeds that I've really looked at in the most detail are the Pug, the French Bulldog and the Bulldog. And I did most of this work um, with my um, colleague, Nai Che Lu, who is now moved back to Taiwan, which is a great shame. And um, this is one of her beautiful slides. And um, this was her PhD project, um, which we developed a little bit further. So we are now looking at different brachycephalic breeds in Cambridge. And it is a little bit interesting to see what's in the different breeds. And it's not anywhere near as straightforward as flat nose and, and airway disease. The boxes have got very little. Um, the, some of the other breeds are not really showing quite the same um, signs or, or even the same obstruction. So I think maybe in, in 15 years time, we will talk about pug obstructive airway disease and, and bulldog obstructive airway disease um, and chihuahuas and the rest of it. So it is very much a breed specific issue. So how are we going to diagnose these dogs? Um, I think the history is super important. And um, the history, I'm going to go through some of the questions I asked because there are the kind of markers that you can use to spot the airway disease. Um, I then think a physical examination, including the functional grading. So the exercise test is, is the next thing to do. Um, we developed this test called whole body barometric plasmography, and it's great because it's it's a objective assessment of respiratory function. Um, but it is really for research. So it's it's um, time consuming. It's, it needs expensive equipment. And the main thing is it needs somebody to run it. OK, so so even when you've got it up and running and we now have the software automated, um, which is fantastic, you still need somebody to spend about an hour, an hour and a half with each dog to get the results. So. So although the plasmographic data is fantastic and it, and it opened up the doorway to talk to the breeders about the fact they definitely had this disease, um, I wouldn't use it in a clinic situation. We've also got radiography and CT, and I was going to mention a little bit about those. And then also I do like endoscopy. I'm mainly doing endoscopy of the respiratory system um, rather than the digestive system. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about that. We just go back one way. So why is it so important that we do full clinical examination and, and really try and work out what these dogs are doing functionally? Um, I think it's important because I can't eyeball these dogs after 20 years. I can't eyeball them and say which are going to be good dogs and which are going to be bad dogs. So these are the grades of our dogs on our Cambridge scale. So zero is completely unaffected, no disease whatsoever. And then we've got the grade ones, which have got really mild disease. You only hear this with a stethoscope, and we consider this asymptomatic, really. And then two is not great, and three is terrible, right? Now, this fawn guy, I would have definitely said the fawn guy in the bottom right, yeah, okay, that's that's not a great-looking dog to me. He also looks like he's about to attack me, so that dog's going down, right? But I would not have spotted that the top right dog was a severely affected dog. And... You know, the, the grade zero is fair enough, nice thin faces, but I don't think I'd have necessarily said that the grade one, the piebald grade one, is a is a affected, a minimally affected dog. So so I can't, unfortunately, I wish I could, but I can't look at these dogs and say which ones are going to be affected. So we do need to do some careful questioning of the owners and we need to look at these dogs super carefully. So what are we asking about now in our history? So 
I tend to start off with respiratory noise and exercise tolerance. Um, I asked them how long it takes the dogs to recover after exercise, but people don't really kind of notice that kind of thing. But if you ask them about a difference between winter and summer, sometimes they'll spot that. OK, um, eating again. Many people don't um, realize that their dogs have got eating issues until you've improved their actual um, airway. But if you eat, ask them if they eat slowly or if they sometimes take a longer time to eat than their other dog, that's when it starts to become a little bit more apparent. We also ask about their eating um, habits, their regurgitation, and their sleeping disorders. And we're seeing more of these kind of dogs now, where these dogs are having sleep disorders. So I don't know if we can call it sleep apnea as such yet, because we haven't completely defined it, but, but it looks like the human obstructive sleep apneas. And they're choking themselves awake. So snoring, and then you, you lose the, the sound of the breathing, they'll choke themselves awake. Um, and they can have a really disrupted night, which means that during the daytime, they tend to have excessive sleepiness. Um, and they're going to do this kind of trying to fall asleep sitting up, which is completely abnormal for a dog. So so people are now recognizing that there are there are different um, clinical signs that are linked to the brachycephalic obstructive airway syndrome. So. If we start with the exercise tolerance, I really want to know how long are these guys walk for? Um, I ask a little bit about the time for recovery. I do go on about the difference between winter and summer. Have they ever collapsed? Do they sometimes have to bring them home early in the summer? All little kind of pointers that they're not doing so well. Um, it can be tricky because owners don't always recognize when their dogs are not recovering properly. So this is a little pug who's done a three minute exercise test. <laughs> And this dog was described as being excitable when he's exercising. Well, he is pretty excitable because he's struggling to breathe. OK, so so owners don't always pick up on the fact that their animals are struggling or, or are becoming distressed when they're exercising. Now, the only other thing I'd say is don't get fixated on the fact it's it's got to be Boas. Um, so this was a young Boston Terrier. He's had Boas surgery. He's been sent to me for a turbinectomy because the Boas surgery didn't work. Well, the Boas surgery didn't work because this dog has got the trilogy of follow. OK, and if you look at that dog, he's not making any airway noise when he's breathing, really. You know, this is air hunger. So he's showing air hunger. But he's got a nice, clear airway. And he was sent to me for a turbinectomy, but I'm not hearing any nasal noise there. So this dog is in respiratory distress when he's mouth breathing with no obvious airway noise. Okay, So just because they are Bostons or Pugs or Frenchies doesn't mean it has to be the airway. And we probably see like two or three dogs every year that have got congenital heart defects um, that can account for their clinical signs. So here we go again with the sleeping disorders. So things I'm asking the owners now is do they sleep with um, their heads raised up? either on a bed or a pillow, or sometimes dogs sleep on their owner's legs. You have occasional dogs that will hang their teeth through the um, bars of a crate to try and open their mouth when they're sleeping. Are they excessively sleepy during the daytime? Have they got that sleeping sitting up? And do they have these nighttime arousals, these choking episodes? Um, and actually, it's pretty good when owners take videos of them. So the video cameras and, phone and smartphones have been amazing for us seeing what these animals are actually doing at home um, in a relaxed environment. And this is when you can get some really nice information on the, on the sleep disorders. So the eating is the choking on the food, eating very slowly sometimes, particularly in the bulldogs, regurgitation, um, excessive flatulence, and then you also have the silent regurgitation. So the dogs that don't bring food back, but they're constantly gulping, licking their lips. So yeah, these dogs are really struggling to, to maintain an airway while they're swallowing. So clinical signs, uh, we are looking for this excessive respiratory noise. We're looking at exercise intolerance, any collapse, any cyanosis, any regurgitation and vomiting, sleep disorders and excessive salivation. And we're trying to pick up some of this stuff when we look at the dogs. 
Um, the respiratory noise, um, we're using now an exercise test. It's really, we used to call it an exercise tolerance test, but we're only doing it for three minutes. So it's an exercise stress test. And we are using this to assess respiratory noise and respiratory effort. Hey. This is just to show you, there are some decent dogs out there. Okay, so this is one of the bulldogs that um, I've been looking at over the last few years. That's normal panting. Okay, so we do have some good dogs out there. Hey. So when we are doing the clinical examination, I'm listening directly over the neck of these dogs. Okay, so I'm listening over the side of the larynx and then we take them out for a slow jog and it's four to five miles per hour. I like to exercise them myself because you learn a lot from exercising these dogs. You can see when they switch from nasal breathing to mouth breathing. Um, if they're affected in the bulldogs, they usually start to show signs about two minutes. So you can you can get some information by watching them. Um, and some dogs, you'll hear the noise during the exercise and not afterwards. So I, I do kind of trot around with these. Also, I'm not doing so much exercise now. I'm getting older. It's a good way for me to keep fit. OK. Now, what noises are we after? We're after this pharyngeal stertor. Your typical bulldog, okay? So that's usually a combination of palate, nasopharynx. This is the laryngeal noise of the pug. So that's strider. It's a higher pitch noise. It's like soaring wood, okay? So it's quite obviously different to stertor. And if you have strider, then we're thinking more around the larynx or the um, trachea. This is the French bulldog. It's still stertor. It's lower pitched, but this is more of a nasal nasopharyngeal stertor. Very common in the French bulldog now. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Now, for years, I did mention to students that I thought Strider was laryngeal collapse, and then I realized that it wasn't really in the text, and before I said that I should prove it, okay? So this is a strider again. And what we did is we, I'll just nip back to that one. We looked at um, dogs and with the strider and then we just checked them when we were inducing them or we scoped them. And it's a pretty good um, way of picking up with laryngeal collapse, okay? So it's very specific. If they've got strider, they have got laryngeal collapse, either grade one, two or three. So either the saccule inversion or the cuneiforms collapsing or the whole larynx collapsing. It's not completely sensitive. So you will have some dogs that have laryngeal, um, particularly grade one laryngeal collapse that don't have strider. Um, but most dogs that have got severe laryngeal collapse will have strider. And it's more sensitive to detect that strider after an exercise test um, than just doing it in, in, at rest, okay? Um, so again, the exercise test does help with strider. Um, it's quite nice to know if they've got a strider because it, you know that you've got a slightly more difficult surgery there. Um, the pugs, it can be dynamic. Um, so we know that, you know, if you treat some of the other areas, it may improve. And the pugs have got a much softer cartilage, we think, in their larynx. They've got a bit more of a chondromalacia. But if you hear strider in a, um, a French or a bulldog, usually you do have significant laryngeal compromise, whether it's collapse or whether it's a granuloma. Um, this is the pug larynx. So this is inspiration inspiration so it's not paresis as such this is just excessive inspiratory pressures so there's too much pressure there to to allow that larynx to um, open up properly on inspiration and then and luckily you get these saccules that are reverted so the saccules and the ventricles sit just in front of the vocal folds and they can um, become edematous and invert and unfortunately then they become quite fibrotic and it is difficult for these to be um, shrunk again once they've reverted. Okay, so once they're out in my head, they're usually out. And this certainly can compromise a, quite a marked area of that rimoglottis. So strider is linked to this kind of change in the larynx. So why did we start using the exercise test? Well, because we were seeing too many pugs and bulldogs, particularly, that used to just sit in the console and they look like this, okay? So you can hear a little bit of nostril noise there, but it's not particularly dramatic. Um, this is after a three minute exercise test. Um, 
And then this is half an hour later in the consult room when we've stopped prodding the dog around, completely relaxed, and you really couldn't hear anything. And it was a little bit tricky initially because the breeders said that we were causing the disease and um, you know we were stressing their dogs and making them the show this airway disease. But you can exercise most um, kind of um, mesocephalic uh, dogs or most um, crossbreeds and you're not gonna get that kind of noise, okay? So I think now people have accepted that you should be able to exercise a dog for three minutes and not hear this kind of noise. And there are a lot of good Frenchies, Bulldogs and Pugs coming out now that can exercise very well without any respiratory noise at all. OK, so so I think this has been accepted. Now, there are other exercise tests out there. So some people do how long you can walk a dog um, in a set amount of time, usually six minutes. Um, other people are doing that you have to walk a dog for a kilometre and see how long it takes. And you're going to um, cut some of those dogs out. And I think they're all pretty useful. So I think any exercise test is better than no exercise test. Um, I quite like the three minute exercise test because I think it is assessing the airway pretty well. So, so moving these dogs a little bit faster does seem to stress the airway and we seem to get decent results. Um, and it's fast. OK, so if you're going to look for, you know, how long it walks in a kilometre and then you have to let it try and see how it recovers, then, then that's going to take a certain amount of time. Whereas I can usually assess these dogs in about 15 minutes. So so the three minute test seems to work pretty well for us. Um, we did look at the the three minute um, trot or the three minute run versus the walk. So it has to be said that both the walk and the trot are better if you want to diagnose BOAS. OK, so you're more likely to diagnose higher grades of BOAS if you exercise the dogs either walking or trotting. But this one compares the trot versus the walk and the trot is more sensitive for diagnosing BOAS. OK, so so I do think that that, that little bit of extra speed is, is worth a bit. OK, now there's a, a study coming out in, uh, from Germany, I think, where they've put them on a treadmill. And I think they were mainly the retro pugs and they seem to get quite nice results with the treadmill. I think they did 15 minutes on a treadmill. I did try a treadmill years ago and um, some dogs tolerate it. But I had a few bulldogs that just went straight over the front um, and some nervous dogs. It, it can take quite a long time to train them to use it. So I think it's a nice idea. Um, but I'm not sure it's necessary just if you want to assess dogs quickly in practice, to be honest. So this is how we set our um, functional grading system. So what we said is that grade zero dogs have got no airway noise whatsoever before or after exercise using a stethoscope. So when you listen to the side of the neck, you can't hear anything. And the grade one dogs, you've got mild um, noise. So you can hear it with a stethoscope. Um, they're not showing any signs of respiratory effort or dyspnea. Um, the grade two dogs, you can hear them without a stethoscope. So this is why it's quite an easy system, because the, the breeders really can't argue too much with you because you can hear the dogs breathe. Right. So if you can hear them breathing without a stethoscope, it's likely to be a grade two dog. Now, we do sometimes let the um, French bulldogs that are quiet most of the time and then put their dogs down and uh, noses down and snort. We let those through as well as a, as a grade one because they read low in the box. But any dog that is breathing constantly and you can hear it audibly, um, then basically, you know, they're a grade two. OK, so it's pretty simple. The difference between the grade two and the grade three is that the grade threes have got um, severe respiratory effort. And I also think they've got dyspnea. Um, we've been talking about this recently because should you be using the word dyspnea in a um, functional grading system that's designed for dogs? Because dyspnea is um, it's a term that describes suffering okay so when you're saying dyspnea um, for humans you're talking about respiratory breathing that's causing suffering and I've left it in actually I left dyspnea in because I think you can see these dogs are suffering so the definition of dyspnea that we're coming up with is that the dogs are visibly um, suffering um, and they are um, to an extent that they will um, ignore all their all other social interactions so these are the dogs that you bring them back from an exercise test or so you're just standing in the consult room and they will be absolutely heaving, their elbows will be abducted, and all they can do is breathe, okay? So they're not responding to contact, they're not sniffing, they're not doing anything like that, they're just standing there trying to breathe, okay? Usually they also have the whites of their eyes showing, and you can see in their faces, so dogs, um, the brachycephalic dog face is quite interesting, you get pulling back of the lips and the eyes, okay? So so I'm leaving it in, okay? So I might not be meant to leaving it in, it's, it's, a, it's a description of suffering, which apparently is too emotive, but guess what? I'm sticking with it. OK, so I think you can sort of spot the grade threes pretty easily. And interesting, when we teach people how to grade these dogs for the kennel club on the, um, the respiratory functional uh, assessors list, 
the great threes are really repeatable, okay? So sometimes there's a bit of movement between ones and twos, which is fair enough because this isn't categorical, right? We put these um, in, in categories, but really dogs breathing can change a little bit. But the grade threes really stand out, okay? So those grade three dogs are very repeatable, which is good. And the grade zeros are very easy too. The grade threes are very easy and the grade ones and twos can change a little bit. So we have um, launched, this is a resp respiratory functional grading scheme for the breeders um, because the genetic test doesn't seem to be with us yet. So we have done a lot of, of DNA swabs in, in many of these dogs and we do have a lot of genetic samples around, but the tests are difficult to work out. It's polygenic and um, we're still not there. Okay, so once we get a um, genetic test in there, then maybe we won't need this so much, but I still think it's really useful um, for the clinic to work out what grade and how severely affected your dogs are, okay? Um, I also think it helps with any airway disease, okay? So this is a little dog that has had bar surgery um, and the owner described her really gasping when she went out for a walk. So I had to walk this dog for seven minutes, right, to get it to, to make the noise. But the owner was like absolutely adamant it was a particular kind of noise. So I got the dog uh, a little bit stressed, got the noise, and then walked back to the owner. And the owner's like, yeah, well, that's worth doing, okay. So even if it's not a straightforward burst, it's still worth exercising those dogs. This was the noise. So it's inspiratory, it's on mouth breathing. It doesn't sound like a laryngeal paralysis, right? Okay. So, let's see if we can move on. So this is the induction. Nice, short, thin palate, um, but the noise is coming from the epiglottic entrapment now, okay? So the epiglottic is retroversing and it's being trapped against the, the back of the pharyngeal wall. And this completely fits with the dog's clinical signs. And for this one, we trim the epiglottis, okay? So, so it is worth using the exercise test, making sure that what you are listening to is what the owner is describing. OK, and this, yeah, this was a seven minute job to get this dog worked up enough to see this disease. OK, so so I completely believe in the power of exercise. Now, what else do we look at with these dogs? Uh, we look at the greater than nostrils. OK, so we're exercising them. We're listening to them really carefully before and after um, uh, our, our, our exercise test. Uh, we are also listening for aspiration pneumonia, trying to rule out if there's any lower airway disease. And then we grade these nostrils. And the reason we're grading the nostrils is because we know if the dogs have got either moderate stenosis or severely um, stomatic nostrils, then we know that they are more likely to have bias. OK, it doesn't mean they have got bias. And annoyingly, we see some dogs with severe stenosis that have got really nice airways and no airway disease at all. But it's not common. OK, so the majority of our dogs, when you look at them, um, have got either um, BOAS has got moderate severe stenosis and the open and the mild has got a much higher chance of not having BOAS. Again, it doesn't fit. You sometimes get open nostrils and BOAS and that's super annoying. But if you were going to change one thing to make these dogs healthier, you would open up their nostrils. OK, so the one thing that we found the strongest confirmational factor is that nostril status. OK, so and I did laugh recently. So you see some breeders now and when they're on Facebook and advertising their dogs, they're actually altering the nostrils on Facebook. OK, so they're, they're doing a little bit of, of alteration of those photos. And um, I mean, it's really naughty and they shouldn't do it, but it does make you think, yeah, they've got the message. OK, so they know now that these open nostrils are important. Now, the other thing I was going to say about these guys is don't assume. OK, so so this is a little um, pug and she's super sweet. And the owner's brought her in because she's had two or three bar surgeries. She sounds great now, but she's doing this. OK, so she's completely collapsing. OK, and trying to sleep sitting up because she's she's got severe sleep apnea. So this little girl cannot sleep. OK, and she goes up and down and up and down. And when we went through, so this is a, a scope picture. So we've gone through this dog's um, nasal cavity. We've gone underneath the turbinates and we've come to the back of the nasopharynx here, just beyond the coeni. And this is a nasopharyngeal cyst, okay? And this is occluding the majority of her nasopharynx. And you can land these with a laser, which I did. And then that hopefully resolved, well, she slept really well that night, so it should resolve this kind of issue, okay? So this is, this is a pharyngeal mass. 
and it fitted beautifully because this dog didn't really have any airway noise when she was awake, but when she's asleep, she's got full occlusion of her nasopharynx. The other thing I'd say is this is a nine-year-old French bulldog now, and I've been tracking this dog for years, beautiful dog, completely clear of boas. So the other thing we shouldn't be assuming is that every dog who is, is a French bulldog or a bulldog or a pug needs surgery because they don't, okay? So these grade zero dogs are out there, um, and they seem to be living very good lives. And, and you know, it'd be interesting to see if the dogs that are grade zero, bo zero boas have also got better spines and, and, and better confirmation in other areas. And I haven't done that yet, but it would be super interesting because this dog look, looks quite nice and long as well. And we've got a tail. OK, so I suspect that if you lengthen the back and give them a tail, you're probably also lengthening the skull. Um, but these are all things that, that we need looking at in the future. OK, so we've looked at these dogs super carefully. We think we know now what functional grade they are. Um, what imaging are we going to do? OK, so now we're thinking about operating on them if they are affected. What imaging is uh, suitable? Well, um, there's a few things that I think are, are really useful. So one is laryngoscopy. You know, just looking with a really good laryngoscope into the oral cavity will give you a huge amount of information. Um, I do like rhinoscopy. OK, so I like to look at the nose. Um, and I do this because I can get a very good idea of how much space there is between those turbinates and whether the turbinates are in the wrong position, which we call aberrant turbinates, um, and whether I can go through into the nasopharynx. I think you do need thoracic evaluation. Um, why do you need thoracic evaluation? Well, because some guys have got these hyperplastic tracheas. And, um, you know, if they're showing severe signs and they're really young and they've got this kind of trachea, then I think the prognosis is pretty severe. OK. So this gives you information for the owner, which may alter their decision of whether to go ahead and treat or not. Um, the other reason I like to do thoracic evaluation, either radiographs or CT, is because I'm ruling out um, any aspiration pneumonia. And if there is severe or marked aspiration pneumonia, for many of the BOAS cases, their elective surgeries, I'll wake them up and I'll, I'll treat the aspiration pneumonia and I'll come back to them um, when the aspiration pneumonia is improved. OK, so if they're showing clinical signs of aspiration pneumonia and the radiographs are pretty awful, then I'll back off and try and get that resolved. Um, you can also sometimes see hiatal hernias on, on plain thoracic radiographs um, and also on CTs, um, although probably the best way to do, evaluate those is with fluoroscopy, but it, you know, it's certainly something we do see as well. Now, what about imaging of the head? Um, we used to start off with um, thoracic, not sorry, thoracic, um, head radiographs, and, and we used to do the lateral and DV. And it, it gives you some information. So you can see there's a huge thick palette here. Um, but we were really doing these radiographs because we were measuring, OK? So we're using them to take measurements of the width and, and the width of the calvarium and, and the uh, craniofrontal ratios. We've now switched to CT. Um, you know, you do get information from, from CT. I don't think you get great information from radiographs of the head, um, but it probably doesn't change what you do in most cases, okay? So I think it's a nice thing to have if the owner's got the budget, but I certainly don't think that it is um, essential. This is the endoscopy, and um, I like this, okay? So, so we do do some of the laser turbinectomies where we're removing part of the ventral nasal conca, um, and I think it's nice just to, to have a little look at the nose because in many of the um, brachies, particularly in the Frenches, the nasal component is super important. OK, so so it is a really nice idea to see what kind of obstruction you do have in the nasal cavity. Now, this is the CTs of the head. And this is one of our grade zero pugs. So this, this is a Boas index. The Boas index is, this, is, is the measurement of um, obstruction with the plasmograph, where we have kind of zero to 100. And you get very few dogs that are zero, and you get very few dogs at 100. And most of the effective ones are sitting in the 80s and 90s. Um, it's unusual to get one that's as low as 14. OK, so a pug with a Boas index of 14 is probably one of the best ones we've got. OK, and this is reflected in the CT. So we've got a, not much of a tongue base here. We've got a really nice thin palate here uh, that looks like to, it's a really good length to me. You've got a very nice nasopharynx and the majority of the, the nasal tissue is fine. You do have some cord labyrinths here, um, but I still think that's a pretty decent CT for a pug. Now, this is our, our Boas index of 93. So this is one of our severely affected dogs, a grade three dog, um, pug. And again, you know, I think you can read this, OK? So we've got a very thick, soft palate here, and it occludes the nasopharynx um, when you've um, put the head in a, in a resting position. 
and we've got quite thickened turbinates here. So these are hyperplastic turbinates in the nasal cavities. So not only do they come forward and go back a little bit into the nasopharynx, but they're just thick. OK, and we've got a thicker tongue. So so I totally understand that this is a severely affected dog and this is a unaffected dog when it comes to Boas. But this one makes me laugh because these are our, our bulldogs. And A is, um, well, I should ask you guys, it'd be lovely to ask you guys, actually, but but A is, is a severely affected bulldog, okay? So so A is a severely affected bulldog, and the palate is a little bit thickened here. It's long, certainly, um, and the trachea maybe, from what we're seeing here, is not huge, okay? Uh, the nose is very decent, okay? And the tongue base, possibly a little bit big, but I, I don't think I would be able to tell you out of A and B which one was a severely affected one, but it is A. And B was completely unaffected, okay? So B is a grade zero bulldog. And I don't think there's a vast amount of difference in those nasal lengths, if I'm being honest. B was obese. So not only was B completely unaffected, B was absolutely huge, okay? So we've got an obese bulldog here with an absolutely brilliant airway, a nice trachea, okay? A soft palate, I'd say, is still a bit thick here. Nasopharynx is fantastic, okay? So this is a completely unaffected bulldog, and this is an affected bulldog. And I wouldn't probably be able to tell you um, unless I knew which was which, okay? And then the other thing I would not be able to tell you is which palette was the worst, maybe, and, and I guess this one is longer. But if you are going to see T heads in, in these guys, absolutely fine, but you're not really going to find any good measurements that's going to tell you in a French bulldog male of 12 kilos, the palette should be this thickness, and in a bulldog that weighs 20 kilos, the palette should be this thickness. So I guess I'm, what I'm saying is, although a CT feels like an objective assessment, the measurements are subjective, okay? Apart from the back of the nasal cavity, the coenia area, which we have looked at and we can say, you know, if it's over a certain proportion of the um, airways occluded by soft tissue, then that, that really indicates nasal obstruction. The rest of these measurements are, are really subjective, okay? So, so it's nice information, but you're certainly not going to read whether your dog needs surgery from imaging alone, okay? So the reason that I operate on dogs is because of their functional assessment. It's because of the way they sound when I'm listening to them and how they exercise, and it is not from the CT. Okay. Now, if I am going to CT, I quite like to CT the trachea and the thorax. Okay, and I often look at the left bronchus, which is usually a little bit compressed in most of these guys. So, if I'm going to CT, I probably CT preferentially the chest rather than the chest and the neck rather than the head. Um, and you do sometimes find some interesting things. So this is a little pug that came in once at a weekend in the summer. And it had acutely um, become dyspneic over, over a, a, I think they were having a barbecue. So it was a weekend, became acutely dyspneic at a barbecue and um, was referred in as an emergency bars, which is fair enough. And I looked at this dog carefully. It was very dyspneic and it had severe bars. OK, so, so absolutely fine. Um, but actually, when you see TD, it's got a lung lobe torsion. Okay, now I didn't hear this right. This this is a left cranial lung lobe, and a little pug, and that's sitting right underneath the axilla. And I didn't pick up that it had denser lung sounds on one side than the other because it's got so much upper airway noise. So, so I think this is a really difficult call unless you do thoracic imaging. Okay, so I wouldn't have picked up that this dog had a lung issue unless I had done the thoracic imaging. This is another one that I quite like. So this is a little pug that had a nice confirmation actually, and. It presented quite early for BOAS and it was predominantly nasal. And the reason it's nasal, it's got a benign nasal tumour up here. I think this is called an angioma. And you see these in humans as well. And they, they regress. And this dog's tumour did regress over the next two or three years. But it did have early signs of BOAS and it did end up having its palate trim. But if you had removed this, if this wasn't present, that dog would have probably been absolutely fine. OK, so, so you do get some interesting information by advanced imaging. Now, the other thing you can always do is you can do you know, thoracic radiographs and do the surgery. And then if the dog doesn't respond as you expect it to, then you can come back and do advanced imaging. Okay, so you don't always have to have advanced imaging before you do your first surgery. You can say to the owner as well, you know, if we do this, you know, initial surgery and things don't respond as if as we wish to, um, then we'll consider advanced imaging. I think that's reasonable. So having discussed imaging and, and our assessment, which are the surgical cases? Well, for me, the surgical cases are the grade three severely affected dogs, um, the young grade two dogs, so particularly those dogs with regurgitation or sleep disorders, um, and the young grade two dogs are going to get worse. OK, so, so the French bulldogs that come in and they started to regurgitate and they've got some sleeping issues, definitely on the surgical list. 
if they're like this, then you kind of know they're going to be better afterwards, okay? So so I do like them quite severely affected because you think, yep, I'm going to make a significant difference there. This is Strider again in a, in a Frenchie. Okay, so definitely the grade three dogs, most grade two dogs. I'm not typically operating on grade one dogs, okay? So so if they come in and it's got very, very mild noise, I'm usually hearing just with a stethoscope, then I'm not usually going for surgery unless there's a specific clinical sign that I think may be linked. So if they're regurgitating um, and they've got stenotic nostrils and they're grade one, I might still open up the nostrils because that might help the regurgitation. But the majority of grade one dogs for us are not surgical. So what are the difficult cases? The difficult cases um, are really those that present as an emergency. Um, the bulldogs or French bulldogs with laryngeal strider, um, the frequent regurgitators because they're quite difficult to manage after the surgery. Um, for us, it's the high stress patients, okay? So those really stressy dogs that get themselves completely wound up are tricky. Um, and then there was a really nice brisk uh, study in vet surgery a couple of years ago, and they pointed out also that previous surgery was a negative prognostic indicator and having an inappropriately low body temperature was also a negative prognostic indicator. So there are some things that are a little bit of like red flags, okay? This one's interesting. So this little dog had bar surgery, um, regurgitated, it got worse. And this dog has got strider and no stirter. And the reason it's got strider is a laryngeal granuloma. Okay, so it's had bar surgery, started regurgitating, laryngeal granuloma developed strider. Okay, but it's in a terrible condition. So, what surgery we're going to do? Um, this is one of Nightshade's beautiful pictures again. Um, we can consider doing the staphylectomy and I tend to do the modified folding flap now. So we are thinning the back of the palate as well as shortening it. We generally take out the averted ventricles. We're going after the nose now. And then that's usually initially our first surgeries with the tonsils. And if it doesn't work, then we come back and then we take out these turbinates. Okay, so initially we're concentrating on the palate, the tonsils and the nose. And then we let the dog settle down. And if that doesn't work, then we'll come back for the nasal cavity. And this is pretty much what it looks like. OK, so um, I should have mentioned as well, we're doing a little bit around the larynx now. So if we have laryngeal collapse, we'll do the cuneiformectomies, where we're just removing this, this corner of the cuneiform, which means that when the animal is breathing in, um, it doesn't dynamically collapse. OK, so you're not making the rimoglottis markedly larger. Um, but you are just stopping that dynamic collapse. And this does seem to work rather nicely. Um, this is what the nostrils are looking like now after the surgery. Um, this is the um, ventral nasal conca, which we are just um, starting to incise with the laser. And then this is what a folding flap looks like when you've finished it. Well, actually, when it's nicely healed. I think we need to set our owner expectations quite carefully. So most dogs are markedly improved. Um, some dogs have got very little response to conventional surgery, which is the palate and the nostrils, and they tend to be the dogs with more nasal signs. So these are dogs that have got really obvious nasal or nasopharyngeal stertor. And when you exercise them, they tend to switch to mouth breathing really quickly. They tend to have a heat intolerance. Um, so a marked difference between um, summer and winter. And they usually excessively pant in the summer. OK, so those are, and they're also often the regurgitators as well. So those are the guys. Um, that are going to have potentially, particularly in the French Bulldogs, not the greatest response to conventional surgery. Now, dogs with the worst prognosis are those that present really young. So I don't like it when they're presenting six, seven months of age. Those in a slim body condition and those with laryngeal collapse. OK, and the slim body condition is because obesity makes all airway function worse. OK, so in any breed, obesity is going to make your airway function worse. So if you have a dog that's super skinny and is still showing marked airway obstruction, then it really does say that their airway is quite bad. OK, so so and with these kind of dogs, I do have very serious conversations with the owners, whether they want to go ahead and treat um, a because, you know, you're often looking at multiple procedures. You know, you're also looking at pretty high morbidity and whether you're actually ever going to give them a really good quality of life might be questionable. OK, so if you've got really severe signs at a young age, 
I think we need to be having super careful conversations with the owner and not promising much at all, to be honest. Now, what about hospitalization? Um, I think we need to try and reduce stress with these dogs. Um, so ideally what I'm doing with hospitalization now is trying to bring the dogs in the morning of the surgery. Um, so they're not sitting in the kennels waiting um, overnight. Um, I do use quite a lot of trazodone um, and I think this helps. And then certain dogs need props. So this guy um, likes to sleep with his um, toy in his mouth and this is great. And if he does this, then he has a much better um, night's sleep because he's maintaining an open um, airflow through his mouth here. OK, so this dog needs his props. OK, um, I split now often my procedures into the consults and then the surgery. And that means that a, you can get the antacids on board. If they're regurgitators, you know, you can evaluate them very thoroughly and then you can let them go home, de -chill, sorry, no, chill out a little bit, and then you can bring them back in separately, straight almost into theatre, so we almost walk them straight into to theatre, um, and it's nice and calming for them. What are we doing to these dogs preoptively? Well, we're usually giving them a meprazole, and the regurgitators, I like them to have a meprazole for about three to five days before surgery. Um, and then we're pre-oxygenating. I still give steroids at induction and um, I've seen people try non-steroidals, but to me, steroids seem to have a better effect on reducing um, edema of the airway. Um, so I, I do like steroids. Well cuffed DT tubes. Um, Post-op analgesia, we're doing now the maxillary blocks and I think they work really well. And usually with paracetamol, that's enough for post-op analgesia. Um, I don't particularly like post-op sedation. If we do use post-op sedation, I tend to use uh, metatomidine, or dexmedetomidine, um, because you can titrate it a little bit. But I think if you sedate some of these dogs too heavily, then you're going to increase regurgitation. Then you tend to get in that cycle of regurgitation, making the airway swelling worse, and then suddenly you're looking at trach tubes. So, so I do try and avoid post-op sedation. What about the regurgitators? Oops, sorry, that was on this slide. Um, so these are the guys that don't obviously bring food back, but are just swallowing and gulping into their mouths, okay? So they might be the silent regurgitators. So again, we use a preoperative omeprazole. I tend to give a metoclopramide um, dose at induction, and then we'll follow up with a CRI of metoclopramide that I'll usually keep going for, for six to 12 hours after the surgery. And we're often giving meropotent as well. Um, the feeding is a question that I really haven't worked out yet. So, so we used to starve these guys um, for 12 hours after the surgery um, or 24 hours after the surgery. Often now I give them a little bit of feed, uh, food before I, I leave in the evenings. OK, so I'm often feeding them about four to six hours after the surgery, just a tiny amount of food, um, something really bland, something very low fat. And I think if they're regurgitators, it actually does help. OK, so so we need to do some multicenter studies on these. Um, but my feeling is now they're probably better feeding them than doing prolonged starvation. Um, the other top tip about meprazole is when you look at the original papers, about 25 percent of dogs get gastrointestinal um, side effects with the meprazole. So they get vomiting and diarrhea. And I think many French bulldogs do do react to a meprazole. So I always try a meprazole first because we have the most evidence that meprazole has got the best efficacy. But I always say to the owners, if your dog's showing obvious vomiting and, and diarrhea, then please tell me and we'll switch to something else. Then I tend to go for famotidine, arinitidine and cisapride. So, so meprazole is my first choice, but I am aware that many, particularly the Frenchies, do react. Now, this is something else I really like. So this is Otravine, which is xylometazoline, which is not licensed in dogs. And we buy this over the counter and I use this if I get a cold. OK, so it's, it's a sinus decongestant. It works on the alpha three um, receptors within the nasal mucosa. So it's selective for the nasal mucosa and it shrinks the mucosa. It lasts for about eight hours and it's really beautiful. OK, so this is about five minutes after giving the Otravine. OK, so it does this kind of thing. It just shrinks back the mucosa. And suddenly you can see um, where your airway is. Now, I give this to my Boaz dogs, usually because I'm scoping them and I want to see a little bit more clearly where the, uh, the branches of the ventral nasal conquer are. But I also now give this to any um, French bulldog particularly that I'm operating on. Because even if it's having something completely different, why wouldn't you improve its nasal airflow and recovery from anesthesia? OK, so so minimal side effects. Uh, we usually put about 0.2 to 0.3 mils up each nostril. And I use um, just a little IV cannula without the styletin. And I think these, this is a, a nice way to improve your, um, your nasal airflow for recovery.
Um, the other thing I like to do is make sure I've got a decent setup in surgery. So I try and, and crank the lower jaw down. And some of the French Bulldogs in particular, the bullets move forward. It's quite close to the temporomandibular joint. And some of those male dogs, it's really difficult to get good exposure. OK, and I am pretty brutal. OK, so this is a multi um, jointed arm from Storz, which I love. But otherwise, I tie the jaws down with, with sandbags or with ties to the table. OK, and I do try and get a really nice exposure. Um, I use loops. I'm of a certain age now and I find it much easier. Um, I love my loops. It means that everything is so much clearer in there. I can see the vessels. I can see everything before I cut it. Um, and the if you're going to use loops, it's a great surgery to use loops on, to learn to use loops because your head's in a pretty steady um, position. So you don't really get so much of that feeling of, of seasickness or, or nausea when you are using them. I tend to start with the tonsils. And the tonsils and the brachies, particularly the French Bulldogs, they are hypertrophic. So they're inverted, usually and enlarged. And we're going to take these out. It doesn't matter how you take them out. So you can use a laser. I usually don't. I usually just use bipolar. You could use a, a vessel sealer. It really doesn't matter. You can put a suture around the base. But the reason we're taking them out is not just to improve a little bit of space in the, in the nasopharyngeal area here. Um, but it's also so that when the um, palate is sutured, you can suture the lateral aspects of the palate to those tonsillar crypts. OK, so I like it to tighten up, tighten up my palate. And also, I think when they're closing their mouth, it just gives them a little bit more space in that pharynx. Now, for the palate, there are absolutely loads of techniques, and I don't think that any have been proven to be any better than others, to be honest. Um, apart from maybe we showed that um, a combination of techniques was better than a previous combination of techniques, but we didn't separate out the individual, separate out the individual surgeries. Um, so these are all described, all nice techniques. Um, I do have to say I have a preference now for the folding flap. This is the original folding flap that was um, described by Finji. And with this one, they were really taking a lot of the palette out and, and basically effectively folding the palette over to about a centimeter behind the hard palette. Um, I think this is a very nice technique. Um, I tend to use the one that Octrin uses because I think this is maybe um, slightly more gentle, but I think they're all good techniques actually. This is a modified folding flap. I now cut the front of the tonsillar crypt um, through the oral mucosa in a U-shaped incision. I then go through the um, stromal tissue. Um, I usually take out most of the palatine muscles as well because I don't want to fold them back on each other. And I trim off the palate at the back of the tonsillar crypt and then I fold it over on top of itself, and then I'm doing five or six sutures um, on top of, well, single interrupted sutures, um, so that I'm hopefully making quite a nice repair here. And I catch the lateral aspects of those tonsillar crypts. There's absolutely nothing hanging down at the back of the pharynx. So it looks like this when you've dissected out the, the stromal tissue, and then when you fold it over, it looks like this. And we're going so short now that you can usually see the nasopharyngeal ostium in French bulldogs and bulldogs, and not quite so short in the pugs. Um, when do we use the folding flaps? We use them when the palate is thickened. So for me, I'm doing this in all my bulldogs now. Um, I do it in most pugs and most French bulldogs. Um, advantage, I'm not sure, but certainly if you image them afterwards, it does look, so this is a thicker palate anyway, okay? So you, you can't completely um, compare these two, but I think that's a nice end of the palate, okay? And because that palate is tensioned, over to the lateral wall, when the dog swallows, the whole palate moves. So even though you just, I used to think, oh my goodness, I've just folded over mucosa, it's gonna be doing nothing, it'd be floppy in the back of the pharynx. It's not true, okay? It moves with the pharyngeal wall and it seems nice and functional. And it makes me happy when I see this on a CT scan. Now we do see complications with our palates um, and we had, we looked at this a few years ago, we had five out of 310. So 1.6%, it's probably more. These are, the, these are the complications we picked up, okay? So there was one here that got a hole in the palate after doing um, a folding flap. I think with this one, we were using monopolar. Um, the sad thing about this one is the breathing was amazing, but the, the dog was gagging or, or choking when it was eating, uh, breathing fantastic. And, then, and we repaired the palate very easily by just bringing the soft palate forward. Um, but I don't think the breathing was quite as perfect then, but hey. Uh, this is, I, I really don't like this one, okay, so this is when you, you do um, a folding flap where you do a cephalectomy in a bulldog and there's too much tissue left um, laterally, and if the dog then pants after surgery, this tissue can swell up, so this is a reason why I try not to leave much lateral tissue there at all now, and this is a folding flap that got um, necrosis after surgery, and um, it wasn't mine, but I, 
you know, I saw the surgery. I don't, I don't really understand what happened here, but I've only seen this once, but it obviously can happen. OK, so complications do happen. I think they probably happen to everybody. I scope a lot of dogs again after surgery, um, often because I'm looking at their nose. And you can often see irregular parts of the palate and you think, oh, OK, I better suture pull through that. OK, so so I think it's probably far higher than this percentage. But these are the ones that seem to cause serious complications. Now, just moving back a little bit now. So now I'm at the larynx. So we've got the laryngeal collapse. So you've got your um, grade one here with the ventricles out. And then we've got the cuneiform. Um, types together here which is a grade two and then this is when your whole thing is collapsing here and the corniculate part of the arytenoid is also collapsing and this is what they sound like and this is a pug pug is a more functional collapse What are we doing about these? Well, for stages one and two, so the ventricular collapse and the cuneiform um, meeting, we can address the primary factors. So we can improve the nostrils, we can um, remove a little bit of the palate. And um, we also now take off these cuneiforms. So for stage twos, I tend to take off the cuneiforms. For the really severely affected um, larynxes, the stage threes, I usually go for the cuneiformectomy first, and then I do Rob White's lovely um, arytenoid laryngoplasty, which I think works well. And then after that, I'm on the permanent tracheostomy. Um, and to just put this in perspective, I've done over 100 cuneiformectomies now. I've done about six arytenoid laryngoplasties, and I've done about six or seven permanent trachs. Okay, so I think most of the dogs we can hold with the cuneiformectomy and doing the other surgeries too. Okay, often the permanent tracheostomies are done because um, owners don't have the budget to go through the stages, which is totally reasonable. Okay, but if I had the choice, this is the way I would do it. Okay, so I'd take the least invasive one first, then I'd do the laryngoplasty. And then if that doesn't work, then I'm going to do the permanent trach. And permanent traits can work beautifully if, you know, if you let them heal well and, and if you make sure you put the muscles, the strap muscles behind that trachea and resect the skin, then we, we do get some nice results, OK? But obviously it is a salvage procedure. Now, I know there's been a little bit of controversy about whether we take the, the saccules, the ventricles out or not. I take them out, OK? Um, there was a really lovely paper by Cantatori where they cut out one saccule and they left the other saccule in and they rechecked them four to six months later and um, they found that the saccules don't regress okay so if you leave that in you're leaving it in okay and and i just find it a little bit upsetting okay so i get those out so i like mine to look like this when they're finished and um i've not so people i think get worried about webbing as well i've never had webbing in these guys so i, I don't really see webbing after removing removing the ventricles um, now, there was a paper that reported a, a, um, a little bit of an increase in initial, initial post-operative complications with saculectomy, so they had an increased risk of regurgitation. Um, I have to say that we have regurgitation in dogs that we do saculectomies in and those that we don't, so I'm not convinced in, in the case that I'm seeing that it makes a huge amount of difference. Uh, this is the cuneiformectomy. Let me just see if I can get that back again there we go. So what we're doing with this is we're just gently trimming uh, the corner of the cuneiform process. And like I said, it doesn't do anything dramatic. You are not massively increasing the size of the meglottis. But what you do do is stop the dynamic collapse of that cuneiform on inspiration. OK, um, so they tend to look like this after surgery. So you've just lost that, that cuneiform process. Um, and I think it, I think they, they do better, actually. I quite like these. I move from that before you hear me say something in theatre. Um, this is our nostril technique. Uh, so this is, again, this came from um, Professor Octoring at, at Leipzig. I think this is a great technique, actually. So he does the ALR fold resection, followed by the traders, OK? And it looks brutal when you finish. Uh, I used to do the old wedge um, technique. Now, with the wedge, I used to take a really deep wedge, a scalpel um, kind of length as far as I could go to try and hit the ALR fold. But I think this is a bit more effective, OK? So we are initially taking the ALR fold and then we are following it with the traders. So your ALR fold, often our guys, it will touch the septum. OK, so it touches the medial septum. So we're going to initially cut across from medial to lateral and then we whip around and we take out the bulk of that ALR fold. So they look like this when we're finished. OK, and um, I think that's important because the airflow in these guys usually is directed dorsally by the ALR fold. 
Um, but if there's no gap at all, then I don't think you're really winning by having it in there. Okay, so many of the LR fold in our guys are static, they're immobile, and they're completely collapsed over to the midline. So they do look a little bit brutal when you're finished, I have to say. It's not the prettiest um, procedure. Um, very fast, but, but a little bit brutal. Um, but when they heal, they often look really good. Okay, so, so this is the dog four weeks later. Um, even a few days later, they usually look okay. Um, they can look a little bit scabby. So this was a, a bulldog that had a, a um, ALOF fold. Um, the wedge is prettier. So why don't I wedge? Well, I don't wedge because but you don't get rid of the obstruction really. So, so this is a surgical scar from the previous wedge resection here. And this is the ALAR fold. And we're still going back. And this is all ALAR fold. And this ALAR fold is over a centimetre in length, OK? And then I'm going to get into the nasal cavity. And here are the turbulence. This is an aberrant rostrum, OK? So I kind of think, although it's a bit brutal, it does work better if you are going to um, do the ALAR fold resection in the traders. What do I do with recovery? I recover them super slowly. Um, really slowly. I like them to be normothermic by the time they come around. I tend to recover them in theatre. Um, I like to do it myself. And what I like to do is make sure initially that they can ventilate nicely off the oxygen. Um, and then I will make sure that they, their pulse oximetry is normal once their tube is out. We only take the tube out when they are swallowing. And it can easily take these dogs like 10, 20 minutes to wake up. And that's fine. You can write up their postoperative sheets. You can do the discharge. You, you know, you can utilize that time. Um, but if I, I find if I recover them in theatre, it's super quiet um, and, you know, you've got not many people around, but you've got enough people to concentrate if anything goes wrong. I mean, you're welcome to recover them in ICU, but but for us, it's busier. OK, and I have everything I need with me in theatre. So I like to um, I like to extubate them myself. I don't give them um, usually post operative sedation. And I, I think the difficult bit is the transition from getting the tube out to really recovering the pharyngeal laryngeal muscles and for that usually what you find easiest is if, if you open their mouths and just pull their tongue forward so you know usually i can try and hold them up for as long as possible or just hold the lips up sometimes we put a gag in them but it's just that little few kind of first few minutes where you just have to try and help them a little bit until they've got full function back now i quite like nebula's adrenaline after surgery it's particularly effective in pugs um, and it works nicely in pugs that are getting stressed before surgery as well. And we tend to save it for the dogs that are having a rocky recovery because, you know, you can see some noise with this and potentially you could get some arrhythmias, though we've never seen it. Um, we're typically using 0.5 mg per kg of adrenaline made up to 5 mils with sterile saline. And we're happy to use this every four to six hours. It also works really nicely in the bulldogs that get a bit stressed. OK, so so we do tend to move quite quickly with this if we think the dogs have got any swelling. We're using these handheld little mesh nebulizers. You can buy them off Amazon for about 30 pounds. You can recharge them and they're quiet. Um, and most dogs seem to tolerate it really well. So that comes on to the when to send home now. So we're usually observing these guys for 12 to 24 hours um, and often feeding the next day. There are some guys that get really stressed in hospital and I'm often sending them home the same day. So this is a guy four hours after surgery. He's looking great, he's super calm. He doesn't like hospital. I'm going to send him home. OK. Um, and if you've got sensible owners, then I think this is totally reasonable. Um, there was a paper that came out at ECVS that, that had a really nice, I think it's an abstract actually last year, that had a really nice result with sending home um, the same day. I don't send all dogs home the same day. So if I'm worried about the surgery, if I think there's anything that's potentially going to cause issues, then I tend to keep them in. I think the argument many people has is, is if you if they aspirate, which they certainly can do, then if you've got them in hospital, you've got a better chance of saving them. That is true. Um, I also think that some of these guys are more likely to, to regurgitate and aspirate if they get stressed. Um, so I think probably you're going to see less regurgitation and less aspiration if you've got them at home. Um, I confess I've sent dogs home and had them aspirate and die. Um, I've also sent uh, had dogs in the hospital who've aspirated and died. Okay, So I've lost dogs both in the hospital and at home. And I've lost dogs five or six days after surgery when I would never have kept them in that long anyway. OK, so so I don't know if we know exactly how to deal with these, but I, I think getting them out to their owners if they are super stressy sooner rather than later makes a lot of sense. What do we send them home with? Well, soft, low fat food. It's amazing how many of these guys now are fed on raw food, which is super annoying. right? Um, so I want them on something that is cooked. 
um, low fat, okay? Um, we're typically just using paracetamol for analgesia. Most of them will go home on a meprazole. If they are severely affected, then we're going to think about cisapride as well, um, and potentially for motadine if they don't tolerate a meprazole. Um, sometimes we send them home on metoclopramide as well, but not so frequently. Nasal care, so I ask the owners to nebulize them at home, and they also need to be able to clean the nostrils, okay, which is interesting. And then we typically see them back six to eight, six to eight weeks post-surgery. This is super important because the owners will generally think they're much better, okay, because they're, they're usually heavily invested in these dogs. And I think if you actually evaluate them yourself, particularly if you see something like the functional grading system where you are um, semi-objective, you do notice that some dogs don't do brilliantly after surgery, okay? So I, I think we have to be honest and evaluate these dogs quite carefully, okay? So when we see them, we do an owner questionnaire, we do the functional grading, we do the whole body plasmography. And um, some dogs are doing beautifully, and some dogs, it doesn't make a huge amount of, of difference, okay? Now, what are the prognostic factors that we found for surgery? Well, for us, it was a slim body condition. It was the age of presentation. So if they present at a young age, they are less likely to do well. It's laryngeal collapse for us was a negative prognostic indicator, which makes sense. You know, if you've got some laryngeal collapse, surely you've got a worse airway or a more advanced airway disease. And then surgical technique also made a difference for us. So we were more likely to have a better outcome if we use the ALR fold trainers technique with the modified folding flap than if we use the wedge resection with a staphylectomy. Okay, I thought this was a very nice paper. So this is the BRISC um, study that was in vet surgery a couple of years ago. And this also talks about the prediction and the risk factors. What about the gastrointestinal disease? Often we're reporting um, or we're operating on these dogs because of uh, regurgitation. And this is one of the older studies, um, a nice study though. Ponset reported 98%, uh, sorry, 98% of dogs had chronic gastritis actually improved. Um, sorry, 98% had chronic gastritis and about 80% of them improved after surgery. Now they did treat for a relatively prolonged time um, with, with medication, which I think makes sense. So I think they had a three week um, course of omeprazole, most of these guys. And um, I think we do see a lot of dogs that do very nicely after conventional surgery. So after the palate, the tonsils and the, the nostrils. OK, so there's a very good chance that you are going to get an improvement um, in the regurgitation by improving the airway. Now, if surgery doesn't work, what else have we got up our sleeve? Well, this is if we've got clinical signs that are persistent. So things like regurgitation, the sleeping disorders um, or even the exercise tolerance. And we've got no improvement for us in the plasmography or you could use the functional grading. And then we are looking at the nasal cavity. And this is when we're thinking about doing the laser turbinectomy, which again, Professor Uchtering has, has really um, promoted as a technique for, for improving the Boas dogs. So we're gonna start off by using the octravene. We're gonna shrink the, the nasal mucosa. And then we're going in with a, with a rhinoscope and we're gonna use um, typically a laser to cut out the ventral nasal conker. Um, and this can either be really fast um, and you can do each side in about 20 minutes or you can be stuck in there for a couple of hours. OK, so so very much depends on, on how vascular the dog is. Um, we do quite a few of the turbinectives. We don't see any real major morbidity or complications with the surgery. Um, the dogs get, unfortunately, a little bit of a nasal congestion for the first seven days. OK, so for the first seven days, it's like they have a very heavy nasal cold. Um, and they tend to be a little bit snuffly and they tend to get a rhinitis. Um, we've never had one with, with marked hemorrhage as yet. Um, and most of these can be done as day patients because you've already done the, the oral airway. Um, so it's a little bit frustrating for us sometimes. Um, I wish I had it as, as off pat as, as Gerhard does. So he's amazing with his turbinectomies. Um, I'm certainly not there yet, but we're, you know, we're working on it. We're improving. Um, and it, yeah, it does seem to make quite a, a lot of difference. I think one thing you have to say is you don't always make them quieter. OK, so if you think about it, you're taking out this obstructive nasal tissue, but then you've got this cavity where the air can still circulate. So so, you know, you would hope you would make them quiet. Sometimes you do, but often you don't. OK, this is one of my favourite little pets. Not always this lovely, OK, but this one was nice, OK? So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that seminar. And um, I assume now I'm going to be passing back to um, Daniela.
Jane, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a, a beautiful um, presentation in particular because there are some you know, myths about the larynx and, and I think it was really, really useful. So now I would like um, I would like to say that um, unfortunately we have had problems with Facebook. So and we had to go live on on LinkedIn. Um, we we are trying to address the problem with with Facebook again. So this uh, Jane's webinar is has been recorded, so we will post it on. Uh, on Facebook and we will try to get the link also on YouTube. So we are working on that. So no worries, we will uh, be back on Facebook hopefully, but also on YouTube. So whilst I'm waiting for, we we are waiting for questions, Jane. So I have already two or three questions for you. So <laughs> don't worry, I have, I have questions if, if we don't have a uh, question from other people. Uh, but in the meantime, whilst we are waiting, because uh, it takes a little bit uh, time to have the question from the people, um, I would like to introduce the, the webinar of tomorrow. Uh, which we will be held by Professor uh, Steen Nissen at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, he is an internal medicine specialist, and he will talk about uh, um, how to use the new Cushing's prediction tool in uh, in our patients. So, uh, Professor Nissen has also sent a video message, as we are now used to. And um, Paolo, if you could share. Uh, Professor Nissen video message, it will be great. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Professor Stein Nissen. I'm an honorary professor at the Royal Veterinary College. Um, I work as an independent internist. I do research, education, clinics. Um, I work for the European branch of the Veterinary Information Network. I do all that, but nowadays, it's very difficult for me to do that job without feeling depressed. Feeling depressed about what's going on. Just a, a few hours flying from where we all are working and where we are doing our job as veterinarians. Some of our colleagues, many of our colleagues in Ukraine have had to stop doing their profession flee their homes, flee their practices, or go and live in the basements of their practices because their country, their independent free country has been attacked by a neighboring country. And this is in Europe, in our Europe. This is awful and it's therefore difficult to stand by and do nothing. Um, like many, I, I do not have solutions either, um, but I also feel it as our duties, as people, people with a heart, to not stay silent. Have a look at the picture next to me. Can you imagine having to drop off your family at the border of your own country? say goodbye to your children, not knowing if you will ever see them again. Then returning to try and defend your home against an aggressor. Can, can you imagine that very moment when you put your family on a bus and see that bus driving, driving away. We get numb very easy, right? This war is now a month old and we start to pay attention to the, to the Oscars. The Oscars don't matter. This matters. What can we do? Probably too little, but at the very least, we can choose not to look away. I'm very grateful for Daniela, for all the colleagues uh, joining in this 
appeal for donations for the Ukrainian goals. Um, and this is our little, very, very little effort in not looking away from this criminal activity going on against a free dem democratic European country. Please consider donating to this appeal. Please consider helping our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, our colleagues, our veterinarian colleagues in Ukraine. That's perhaps very little, but at least it is something. This Wednesday, the 30th, um, I will uh, be holding a seminar about one of my uh, favorite topics, uh, Cushing's disease. Hoping to see many, many of you there. I will uh, try to make it as interesting and fun as possible to teach you how to diagnose Cushing's disease in a very easy way using the latest of research that uh, we've come up with uh, through artificial intelligence. So it's going to be a great seminar, a great seminar with an awful background, of course. Um, so let's try to stick together as a profession, a profession I know has a humongously big heart and let's show that heart for the Ukrainian people. Please share this message to your friends and colleagues. Every single person that um, contributes to this appeal can make a little, little difference. Let's not look away. Thank you, Stein. It was impressive what you just said. Um, yes, please follow us. Don't, don't, don't leave us because of the problem on Facebook. Just follow us and keep donating because we, we need you, and we need you help to help the people in difficulties in Ukraine. Um, yes, um, Paulo, do we have question for Jane? Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Katie Bruna. So whilst we are waiting, I have, um, let's start with my question, Jane. <laughs> so um, you, when you were talking about the Cavalier King Charles, yeah, mm -hmm. and, and you showed us the entrapped epiglottis, so, uh, did I understand wrongly, or did you say that you would trim the epiglottis, or you would trim the soft palate? What 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 was? So the palate had already been trimmed, Daniela. Yeah, so exactly. the dog had had two bar surgeries. So I trimmed the epiglottis. Okay, so I did the subtotal epiglottectomy and, and trimmed that. Yeah. Okay, so you you do you consider to do the epiglottopexy ever? So I have done it, and I think it's a it's a decent thing to do to check if that is a problem. But my understanding is that you'll probably I think there was a nice paper out by Ronan Cullins or Mullins. It was Ronan Mullins a few um, last year or the year before, and um, they seem to think that you have a better success rate if you do the um, resection rather than the pexy. And I've done a few resections and I've not seen major issues. So, and I've taken out epiglottic um, epiglottis before because of tumors. So I'm not I've not associated with the major issue if I remove it. Mm -hmm. And how much do you reset the epiglottis? So just uh, like a few millimeters or either like a centimeter? Uh, how much is depending on the patient? Sorry, so I'm just... just. Um, I'm pretty radical, right? So I take it back pretty much three quarters, right? Um, okay. So, so I, I, I take the majority of the epiglottis away if I've got retroversion. I usually just leave about a half a centimeter, a centimeter. So actually, sorry, about half a centimeter. So literally it can't flip back up. Okay. Um, and I, I have taken a few away because of tumors and I, I've not seen issues. So, so yeah. Okay. And you suture the mucosa to mucosa then? Yeah, yeah. And I think because when the dog swallows, it moves the larynx back. So when the dog swallows and the larynx moves back, the tongue base moves up. And because many of these guys have got really nice tongue bases as well, I, I've not seen major. I know there is an increased risk of aspiration, but I haven't seen much. No, no. They say also in the, um, 
VSSO, when they have like mast cell tumors or tumors in the epiglottis, yes, they, yeah. they, they resent the epiglottis, they, they don't have much, much issues. Yeah. Thank you. And then now, the one of the problems that I, at least I, I for me, is um, with these uh, large or thick uh, neck French bulldogs, maybe main, not the one that's big mm -hmm. head, big neck. Yeah. Um, um, following following the folded flap palatoplasty or staphylectomy, they still have this the, the, the macroglossia. Okay, the, the big tongue is like a stick in the mouth, which uh, if you if you don't pull out the tongue uh, in the mouth, is is it obstructs the, the the entrance of the larynx. So. Uh, what do we do? Because when, when we are in front of these cases, most of the time we have to do a, a temporary tracheostomy to, to wait until the swelling of the fully flap palatoplasty resolves, despite, you know, we give uh, steroids or how, 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 so it's just uh, me having the problem or, or have you had? I think, I think they are tricky, Daniela. Um, I mean, we, we tend to give steroids. And the other thing I do, actually, which I think does help, is I, I cold pack the palate. So once I've done the staphylectomy, I put an ice pack in there while I'm doing the nostrils. So that seems yeah. in there for five to ten minutes. I think that does help as well. Yeah. And then I think the, this really slow recovery makes a massive difference. So yeah. that, that slow recovery, so that they're almost awake instantly. Um, literally, you know, I like them to be looking around, blinking at you before the tube comes out. We, we we usually seem to be able to ride that initial obstructive period. I used to do quite a lot of temporary tracheostomies. So I used to do temporary tracheostomies for dogs that um, had laryngeal collapse, you know, grade two or grade three. And I've changed a little bit back from that recently because we seem to manage them without them. So, so we do end up doing some trachs sometimes, but I think far less than I used to. I used to you know, I used to do it to avoid the issues. And the, the thing that bothers me sometimes is you have a surgery and it goes quite well and the dogs look great, but they can't sleep, okay? And then sometimes I end up doing a temporary trait because I think, well, you know, you, you're fine when you're awake, but as soon as you're sleeping, then then you're obstructed, okay? Yeah, so those are the ones that sometimes I end up doing traits on. Okay. We have a question uh, from uh, Elisabetta. Um so hi Jane, when do you think is the best age to do staphylectomy surgery or staphyloplasty surgery? Uh, a few months old or in adulthood? Thank you. Thank you for that question, Elizabeth. So, so I generally only operate on dogs when they've got clinical signs. So most of the dogs I operate on are kind of adults. Um, we will see some from seven to 12 months of age. And if they show clinical signs at that stage, then I will operate on them. Um, but I'm waiting for clinical signs. And then usually I think once your dog's got clinical signs, the sooner rather than the later is probably better because it's going to get worse. So so once they develop clinical signs, fine, I go for them. But I won't I won't do any preemptive um, pre surgeries because I'm not sure those dogs will actually need the surgery. So Usually for me, it's it's seven to 12 months is the earliest. And most dogs, I will try and hold out to 12 months. I don't think they're really skeletally mature until they're 12 months. And things like bulldogs change a little bit because the tracheas are growing. So I've had bulldogs that I would have said you would have had to operate on at four months and you get to 12 months and they're fine. Um, so I'm very much going on clinical signs. And, and most of them, I try and push out to 12 months. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, another question is um, about the alar fold um, uh, resection. So the technique that you have shown, so uh, you you do not stitch then the no. You just leave because I saw that it it is open, and mm -hmm. this is when you say that it just scar it makes it creates a scar a little bit, and then with the time it it healed basically. Yeah, and you have never had problems with that, yeah, I guess. I've do. never had problems with them. I've not. I mean, I've been doing them for what, for nearly nine years now, and um, we've not had any that have had stenosis afterwards. Or now that's not true. I've never had any scar afterwards. I've had one or two that have collapsed a little bit inwards, and I yeah. think that's if you have a lot of pressure behind them. So say you've got a lot of turbulence behind them, and I think they don't always stay out so nice. I think some of those go in a bit. And if they're asymmetrical, you can usually predict from the scope which side is going to shrink in a little bit more. 
who have had no scarring and no real issues with them, actually. I think the only thing I would say is sometimes it, you don't get as much out as you would like. Sometimes I think I'm not taking the full ALAR fold, so then I'll go back now and have another go. They bleed after surgery, and we put cotton buds in with adrenaline on them. And by the time the dog's awake, those cotton buds are usually out. And you don't usually have any issues when you're sending them home. So I've never had any marked hemorrhage after doing an ALAR fold. It bleeds at the time, but then it, it's usually all right. Another question that is often asked, in particular in the, during the sign-out, is uh, whether the, the patient should have a buster collar to avoid them to touch the nose. And I never use a buster collar because, simply because the, the neck is so thick that the, <laughs> the normal buster collar seems to strangulate them. Do you use buster collars after surgery? No, and, and I don't have any sutures, so, you know, there's not, the only thing they're going to do is chew their catheters out, right? So we usually have those catheter protectors on instead, and I'm not using buster collars. They don't touch the nose when he's, um, when he's um, after the ala fold resection, they, they, they don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm asking for the others now, because I, <laughs> I, know, I know that they don't touch it, but <laughs> just, yeah. Yeah, they don't seem to touch it, and they can't do any damage anyway. So so once you've cut it out, that's it, right? So so I'm not particularly worried if they rub them or do anything, okay? Elisabetta is asking another question, uh, saying, what is, what, it, what is it the difference between the folded flap palatoplastic and the modified uh, flap palatoplastic? So the original folded flap just cuts further forward, okay? So it goes really quite close to the hard palate. It's a little bit more radical. The modified folding flap is, um, is a little bit further back to the rostral tonsillar crypt. I've now started cutting the modified folding flap a little bit further forward. So I'm moving towards the folded flap. Um, but it tends a little bit on the breed. So I tend to, uh, to take the bulldogs and the French bulldogs a little bit further forward because I think they have more issues with the nasopharynx. Most of the pugs don't seem to have a majorly thick palate. So those I don't think need a huge modified folding flap. So it's just how far forward you are cutting. And um, I'm becoming a little bit more radical with my folding flaps now. Thank you, Jay. So any other questions? Do you ever use, do you ever use metoclopramide CRI when they are under anesthesia to reduce? Yes. Yeah, so if they're regurgitating, so if they're what I call frequent regurgitating, so daily regurgitating, yes, we do definitely use frequent um, the RIs and metoclopramide. Right? I usually keep them going afterwards as well for about six yeah. to 12 hours yeah. until they're eating properly, really. Yeah. Okay. And, and when you do the um, cuneiformectomy, yeah. also obviously you do with cold blade with, mm -hmm. with scissors and then you don't, you don't suture anything, yeah? No. No. There's a little vessel in the, just sits underneath the cuneiform. In the bulldogs, you need to bipolar it, um, but okay. in the pugs, you're usually okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I don't see any other questions. Um, therefore, we are nearly there with, we well, are nearly two hours doing this. So, mm -hmm. Jane, this was an excellent, excellent um presentation thank you so much thank you thank for you. being with us to be part of the original group of the, the original 15 and um, mm -hmm. hopefully we will uh, you will stay with us also for in the future for the next webinars and mm -hmm. i think um i don't want to keep you longer because you have dedicated really a lot of your time to these initiatives and they and therefore uh, uh, we all thank you and we are very grateful um Unless you want to say something before going, then I, I just... Um, I'd just like to say thank you to you and Paolo, Daniela. So you've done a great job on these. And, and as Dean was saying, it's, it's very distressing what's happening. And to feel that you make the smallest contribution is something, okay? So, so I hope we get some funding, some more funding from tonight. And thank you very much for you and Paolo for organising these. Thank you, Jane. And as Jane says, look up is the, what is it here? The, <laughs> the link, so click on www.justgiving.com slash vets for Ukraine and please donate even a little bit because every little helps. Thank you, Jane, and good night. Good and night. I'm sure I will see you soon. Bye, 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 everyone. See you Thank tomorrow you. With, with Professor Stein Nissen. Bye, bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>